I am super excited to introduce to you guys Jessie Young. Um, Jessie comes to us, like I said, from San Francisco. She works for a um, company called Thoughtbot, which is actually a pretty, pretty big community, uh, or I'm sorry, a pretty big um, name in the Ruby on Rails community. Um, she did not start out as a developer, and she's going to tell you a little bit more about her story of how she came to be a developer. Um, so hopefully properly caffeinated, Jessie Young. <laughs> All right, thank you, good morning everyone. Thank you for showing up at 8 a.m., is it? I don't even know, 8 a.m. <laughs> here we all are. Um, I'm really excited to be here and excited for the panel afterwards. Um, but first I wanted to talk to you all a little bit about, like Becky was saying, about who I am and what I do and my journey to get here um, and some lessons I learned along the way. So I'll just kick off with that. Um, so like she was saying, I work at ThoughtBot. We are a web development consultancy. Um, I'm a developer there. I've been there for almost three years. And as a consultant, I write a lot of code. Um, in an average eight-hour day, I'm probably writing code for seven and a half hours. Um, but I also do a lot of other things. I train developers. I help our clients hire developers. And I'm working with clients like all over the board. Like I've worked with Microsoft. We've worked with Dropbox in our office. Um, who else? Just a lot of high profile companies and then a lot of companies that you've probably never heard of. A lot of startups that are trying to get their first round of funding or they have a few customers and they want some help with development and we can kind of guide them on technology decisions, everything from which frameworks to be building with to minor decisions like, you know, test first and just helping them get all their best practices in place. Um, so that's me. I'm like, I come in, I like have my superwoman cape on, and I'm like, I'm here to save the day. Like, I am the developer. And so that's what I do today. So when a lot of people meet me, especially in that context, they think like, oh, you're probably like, you probably were like, taking apart your computer at eight years old, right? You're probably programming in Visual Basic. You're probably, you know, starting at a super young age, interested in computers, love programming, you know, just like the classical, what you think in your mind is like the stereotypical engineer, they probably think that I have that background. Um, but like Becky alluded to, I do not. Um, five years ago, I had never written a line of code in my life. Um, I was telling some of the other panelists earlier that I learned HTML with Dreamweaver. <laughs> um, I was doing marketing and they were like, oh, we have these emails that are written in HTML, can you edit them? And I was kind of like, sure. Um, and so I downloaded Dreamweaver, started dragging and dropping things around and that was kind of my first experience and that was five years ago. Um, so my path has been a very non-traditional one. Um, started with going to, do you guys know Railsbridge here? No? Anyways, Railsbridge is like a one day Ruby on Rails workshop that um, they put on, similar to Girl Develop It, that there are chapters all over the country. Um, that was my first experience with programming. And that had kind of a snowball effect. I went to Railsbridge, I went to a few more, um, found myself going to a coding boot camp, found myself with an, with an apprenticeship at ThoughtBot, and now I've been full-time at ThoughtBot for three years. So that was kind of a general overview of my path. So coming from this super non-traditional path, um, I've learned a lot because if anyone in the room has ever tried to learn to code, I assume a lot of you have kind of made an effort or you're already developers trying to get better. Um, you know when you ask people advice, developers love to give advice. <laughs> they love to answer all of your questions and tell you what they've learned. Um, but not all of the advice that I got was good. Um, sometimes I got some pretty bad advice. Sometimes I got a little bit frustrated on my path. So. I've learned a few lessons along the way and I'm going to share those with you guys and hopefully they can help you out. So first, um, a poll. Um, when I say go, show me with your fingers on a scale of 1 to 10, how difficult do you think it is learning to code? 1 being like super, super easy, 10 being like sending a man to the moon. See a 1, see some 10s, see a 5, okay. So kind of all over the board in here. So that's kind of a trick question because all of you are wrong, <laughs> um, but you're also all right. So coding is both really, really easy and really, really hard. 
So some of the advice that I got from people, actually this was some of the most common advice was, oh, you want to learn how to code? You should just like start coding. And like, you know, the best way to code is just to like build an app. And I, <laughs> that was some, <laughs> yeah, what app? That's a good question. Um, and, you know, so I got that advice. I said, okay, I'll just start coding. So, you know, you get online, you start Googling around, and a few hours later you're like, man, I don't even, I don't even know what a text editor is, you know? <laughs> that's kind of step zero there. So, um, so that advice, that's on the really, really, that's people saying it's really, really easy and it feeling really, really hard. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, some advice I got was, oh, you want to be an engineer? You should definitely get like a master's in computer science. And actually, like, I know you have a bachelor's degree in political science, but you should like also get a bachelor's degree in computer science. Um, so those people are making it sound really, really hard. And I've also found that not to be true. Like, I do not have a degree in computer science. I work with a lot of really amazing developers who do not have degrees in computer science. And so that's on the spectrum of like, it's easier than that, but it's not as easy as just learn overnight. So I guess the lesson I learned related to that is about persistence. Um, I think that anybody can learn to be a developer. It's not like you have to be some kind of a math genius. You don't have to have, you know, a million letters after your name. Um, but you're not going to learn overnight at the same time. So you need to persist through that. You can't just kind of say, oh, I'm going to go to Girl Develop It, and then I'm going to watch the panel, and then I'm going to be a developer. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> Unfortunately, that would be really cool. But at the same time, like, if you start coding and you, you know, you, you work on a little app or you, you, you know, decide you want to try a new language and you get stuck, like, I've had that feeling. I've been stuck for days on something that, looking back, was really, really simple, but I just had no context for what I was doing. And I persisted through that. And over time, like, you look back on what you learned, and you're like, man, I knew nothing. And, like, it's so amazing to see how you progress if you just stick with it. So that's one thing I learned is persistence. Um, another thing, and actually Becky alluded to this earlier, is about multiple paths to multiple ends. Um, so another thing about advice is that people love to just like tell you exactly what they did. Um, so everyone's like, oh, you know, like I'm an engineer at Apple, so like if you want to be a developer, you probably just like want to be an engineer at Apple and like here are the 10 things that I did and like you should just become me and then you can have my job. <laughs> But that's not, <laughs> that's not how it works. And in fact, that's not you know, what you want. You want to go for a career that matches your abilities and your strengths. Um, so something I tell people a lot about my job as a consultant, like yes, I'm, doing, I'm coding, like I said, seven and a half hours a day, but the hardest problems in my job are people problems. So the most difficult things that I deal with are clients with unrealistic expectations, or situations where people aren't communicating correctly. And that's actually good for me because, I don't even know if I even mentioned this, I was in marketing before. So I was doing marketing for a startup and it's really interesting. A lot of people, when I told them I was interested in learning how to code, would go like, oh, um, it's weird because I always thought that you liked people. <laughs> I was like, okay, um, yeah, I do. Like, I do like people, but like my strengths at working with other people and collaborating are completely utilized in the job that I have. Um, that's not to say that there aren't jobs that are more strong on like the hard sciences of engineering, where like you need to be like this algorithm superstar. Um, but that's not the job that I have right now. Right, the job I have right now, you have to be a competent coder and you have to be really good at communicating so that you can work with clients and you have to also be able to tra train other developers. So I guess that's another lesson I learned about kind of the multiple paths to multiple ends. Like I think a lot of people think, oh, a career in, as a developer or a career in technology in general is one thing. And it's not. Um, there are a lot of different positions, as the panel shows, and then there are a lot of different types of engineering jobs within development itself. So, you know, as you make your journey forward and say, oh, I want to be a developer, I want to do this, like, you, you can find a position that leverages your strengths, and those are actually going to give you a competitive advantage as you go on the marketplace. It's not just, like, the pure, raw coding skills that, that people want to see. Okay, so, and then a third lesson is around community. So, everybody here obviously already understands the value of community because you're all here at this community event. <laughs> so, 
you're already doing this one, yay you. Um, but for me, community and networking were a huge part of my ability to transition from marketing to engineering. So like I said, my first experience in programming was at a workshop with RailsBridge, which is a nonprofit, just like Girl Develop It. Um, at that time, I had zero friends who were developers, um, and now I have dozens. And all of those I've met either directly or indirectly through the community events that I've gone to. Um, and so that's friends Then talk about job opportunities, right? Like you don't always know what the job opportunities are in a field if you're new to that field. But if you start going to community events, you start hearing about things, you meet people, like the person sitting next to you today could get you your next job, not you, because you've no one next to you. <laughs> but like I've met people that see, you know, just casual, oh, hey, so nice to meet you. Yeah, I'll follow you on Twitter. Oh, you know, connect on LinkedIn. Let's have coffee sometime. And, you know, three years later, I find them, you know, asking me if I'm interested in working for them. And that's just been such a crucial part of my process and my journey. Um, and also just, you know, speaking from the female perspective for support. Um, you know, like I was saying, it can be really frustrating and you can feel like, man, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. Um, at certain times. And then you go to a meetup and you meet 10 people who feel the exact same way. And you're like, oh, okay, we all feel this way. Well, let's just keep going together. And you kind of get strength from that and, and continue to work with those people as you go forward. And then, you know, you all have coffee five years later and go, oh, we were so cute back then. <laughs> um, so that was my third lesson about community. And then the final, the final lesson I learned is just that that the world of development and, and programming is always changing. Um, so it can often feel like, you know, as you look forward and you're interested in learning how to code, it's like, oh my gosh, there's just so much to learn. And like now that I'm standing in these shoes, having been doing this professionally for three years, like I can tell you that I feel the same way. <laughs> and that's because everything's always changing. Like someone earlier was referencing using React in a project. Um, like React is this like JavaScript framework that's relatively new and it's like, I've never even touched React. So like if I start working with React tomorrow, I will be as new to it as somebody who just started programming today. Um, of course I have a certain base because of other languages I've learned, but we all have to keep moving forward and learning. And that's something that's really, can be frustrating about programming. <laughs> it's not like you learn a language like Spanish and then, you know, in Spanish you go, oh, okay, you know, I'm fluent in Spanish. I can just go around and speak Spanish to people. Um, you might be fluent for like 10 minutes in, in Ruby and then <laughs> something new comes out and you gotta keep learning, keep moving forward. Um, so, that's all that I have. So, yeah, so I guess I'll, quickly review. So I guess the things I've learned through this process of like going marketing to engineering over the past five years is, you know, persistence. Like I really, I truly believe that like anyone can do this career. Um, anyone can make the transition from any field into software development, but you do have to be persistent because there are going to be those people that say like, just do it, just, <laughs> just write an app. And, and it's not that easy, but it is possible for anybody to learn over time. Um, and then multiple paths, like software engineering careers come in all shapes and sizes. Um, you're not, like just because you want to be a developer doesn't mean you want to go and like sit in a room and be alone with your computer eight hours a day. Um, you can leverage your skills in multiple ways, in many ways. Um, and then the importance of community networking. Everybody here already knows the importance of community networking, but I like to, to hammer that home because it's just been so, so crucial for me. Um, and then there's the field is always changing. So, you know, we're all beginners every day and that's, that's an awesome feeling and it's what makes this field so exciting. Um, so those lessons are what I have to share today. Um, I really look forward to discussing all of these and more on the panel after this and that's all, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jesse. That was lovely. Um, so let me really quickly introduce you guys to the rest of our wonderful panel up here. Um, I'm going to go down the line and, and give you just a little brief intro to everybody. Um, but I am going to, just for the sake of time, I'm going to introduce them, but I am going to ask them all. So at GDI, for those of you who have been in our classes, know that we always ask a stupid question at the very beginning. Um, 
and and usually it's either uh, if you could have lunch with somebody living or dead, who would it be? And that question's way too hard, so I'm just going to ask you, what's your, what's your favorite breakfast food as I introduce you? So I'm going to start down on the end. This is Julie Murphy. Um, Julie is uh, the, the person who came to me when I said, I said to the, the folks over at Centrifuge, I was like, I really need an executive who knows digital, who's been around the block a few times, um, who, you know, C-level, uh, th- who do you got? And they said, Julie Murphy, call Julie Murphy. She'd love to do it. I was like, great. So here's Julie. Um, Julie is the CEO and co-founder of a startup called Bonobi. Um, and she has, uh, has indeed been around the block, uh, including a four, years, four and a half year stint as the CIO of uh, the American Financial Group. So um, indeed, Julie, who, what's your favorite breakfast food? Uh, well, Diet Coke, not an advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> and, and multi-grain Cheerios, because they go so well together. There you go. I don't wow. pour the Coke on the cereal. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, sitting next to Julie is Shannon Lewandowski. Uh, Shannon is the VP of Business Innovations at... Um, at Rockfish, I had the pleasure of working with Shannon uh, in a past life, and know that she is uh, a problem solver uh, in in a definitely a, a female leader um, as far as technology goes. And so um, she's she's really been great to work with. Um, she uh, started her career as a developer, as a Java developer, um, kind of following her. You may have noticed in her bio online that she had a, she had a very lucrative basketball career at NKU, and then decided to be a developer. So that goes to show you that. Stereotypes are wrong. Developers can also be athletes. <laughs> uh, Shannon, what's your favorite breakfast food? Uh, crepes. Mm-hmm. What did you say? Cra- crepes. Oh, crepes. I thought it was like grapes. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> With crepes. <laughs> crepes, crepes. There we go. Um, next to Shannon is uh, Nikki Ridenauer, previously known as Nikki Fowler, who uh, joins us after just getting married four days ago. Guys, that's wow. awesome. <laughs> um, Nikki is a, a kind of jack of all trades. She is representing the sort of UX design discipline, um, but she is su- so to the to Jesse's point about community. Je- uh, Nikki is super super involved in our in our local Cincinnati tech community. Um, she is uh, also very involved in the startup community. So she, for example, sits on the board of AIGA, um, which is our uh, what is it? American Institute of Graphic something. It's design. Okay, it's our local design community, but she represents that, uh, the startup um, world on the board of AIGA. Um, She co-organizes our local UX uh, meetup group, and um, what's the, oh yeah, she also co-organizes Startup Weekend, which, quick plug, for all you ladies who are interested in kind of taking what is the next step, Startup Weekend is doing a women exclusive event, and that's in two weekends from now. on May 29th, uh, there is a there is a, a fee to get in, but we have a GDI coupon code or um, I guess registration code if you are interested in doing that. That's a really great event. Nikki um, helps co-organize that as well. Um, Nikki, what's your favorite breakfast food? Um, sesame seed bagels. <laughs> nice. Wow. With, or with, with or without cream cheese? With cream cheese. Oh yeah. Plain. Mm-hmm. Plain. Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, Next to Nikki is Laura Gels, and I got schooled on how to pronounce your name. <laughs> uh, Laura is a senior art director at Northlake, and, and similar to Julie, Laura came to me because I asked a bunch of people in my network that I need, I need a designer who really knows digital. Um, Laura's background, she's, she is a dap a dapper, um, and so she she touches a lot of digital design, but she also kind of dances around other media as well. Um, so she is not exclusively um, um, digital, but is a digital powerhouse. So we are so happy to have her representing kind of the design discipline of things. Um, and then we have Kristen. Kristen is uh, the home team here. Kristen works for Gaslight. Um, Kristen is what we call at GDI a unicorn. So that means she is both a designer and a developer, a front-end developer. Um, so she has a really, really unique perspective. Um, and I, I think that's kind of the norm at Gaslight, isn't it? Most yep. of your designers are also front-end devs, which is which is actually really powerful and really awesome. Um, it, actually, I have a question about that in a minute as we get into the <laughs> panel. Uh, so, oh, did I skip your favorite breakfast food? I totally okay. did. Blueberry pancakes. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Kristen? I was going to say, my first Dreamweaver site was all about the king of breakfast, cereal. Really? It really was. That's hilarious. (laughs) Any cereal in particular? Um, I've been on the life train recently, but... All right. 
I mean, all of them. Yeah, an equal opportunity cereal. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Jesse, what's your favorite breakfast food? Um, I well, my most frequently eaten is just those individual yogurts. Okay. Just every day. <laughs> Particular flavor? Um, I like pomegranate. Greek or not? Greek. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like the individual. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> all right. So here's the way we're gonna do this. Um, I'm gonna moderate some questions uh, that we're gonna ask the panels, but you guys are obviously, of course, welcome and encouraged to kind of open Q&A. So if I don't see you raising your hand, flag down Becky either um, as well, and, and kind of shout so that we can all hear what your question is, because um, this mic may get a lot of feedback if I try to run it around. Um, so I'm gonna give them a couple moderated questions. Panelists, you do not certainly need to answer everything, like every one of you doesn't need to answer everything, but um, answer if you, if you feel strongly or have a great experience. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to kind of make this a dialogue. We want you guys to have your questions answered and um, we want you guys to get a really good understanding of kind of what this transition looks like, what, what is the experience of being a female in technology, um, especially kind of in it, with it being so male dominated, what does that look like? So. Um, I'm going to start by asking you a question that um, that is for all of you, which is simply um, kind of tell us tell us about your day to day, tell us about um, what what your team looks like, what your immediate team looks like, and and uh, kind of give the audience a little bit of an idea of of kind of who what your touch points are on a daily basis and who you're interacting with. I'm going to Julie. I'm just going to start with you Congress, since you're down on the end. I. Um, started about nine months ago, um, a new startup, uh, tech startup. We're in an accelerator program uh, out on the east side of town called Ocean. My team is very small. We're in the bootstrap phase of our business. So I have the privilege of working with my 20-year-old daughter, which is exciting. Um, I have a technology co-founder um, that actually lives in uh, Eugene, Oregon. So we communicate electronically every day. We hang out. Um, we just hired our first intern, so as you start to hire people, it's like an exciting um, part. This is absolutely new virgin territory for me in terms of my uh, professional career. So I'm in my third chapter, and so we make it up every day as we go along, which is exciting. Cool. Janet? All right. Um, my day-to-day -day looks different every day, um, which is one of the reasons why I like um, the role I'm in now. It combines a lot of the things that I'm really passionate about. Um, you know, we spend time um, on stand-ups in the morning with the development team, trying to set priorities on the things that we need to focus on that day. Um, you know, we're currently working on a number of mobile applications. Um, I spend time um, on the phone with my client, who's mainly based in New Jersey, as well as a bunch of partner agencies as well. Um, so it's kind of a team account. Um, it's a very large account, so we there's a lot of agencies involved. So we're um, we're also reviewing um, and creating a lot of deliverables. So I do a lot of work now in PowerPoint, but I also review design and I review UX for those mobile applications and um, work with um, my team, which is actually pretty small. But um, you know, we're all reviewing reviewing those deliverables and trying to set the, the roadmap and, and features for for the mobile applications or digital properties that we're, that we're working on. Awesome. Um, mine totally depends. Right now, I'm, I, and for the last two years, I've been contract and freelance, uh, doing freelance work. So it totally depends where I'm at, if I'm at an agency or a startup um, and budget. You know, sometimes the, like the agency, I can completely do wireframes and pure UX, pure UX work. Um, but then for startups, usually I'm doing UX, design, I'm talking to development and strategy and business. Um, so yeah, it really, really depends on which one I'm at. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm the same way. Um, so as an art director, I do a lot of the design work. So from day to day, I might work with a developer um, hands-on. We might be um, you know, figuring out how it, it's going to look um, when it's finished, uh, when it's programmed. But um, like today, I'm going to a TV shoot after this, so I won't touch any <laughs> development. And we're, we're techie, we're doing um, web videos, so we have, um, we'll have one developer on set to sort of make sure that we're following all the rules uh, for the web space. But um, again, I, I'll do uh, UX as well, so I'll work with the developer um, once I finish those designs to make sure that they're, those UX designs are usable before we actually make them pretty um, with uh, visual design. So there's a little bit of a difference there. 
Um, and then we're here at Gaslight, a consultancy, so we're kind of taking on a bunch of different clients. And so what we do is basically I'm attached to one client and one project along with two developers. And we sit downstairs, we have our, all three of our desks are kind of put together, and we just work on the project all day long. Um, we're talking back and forth. We have a stand-up every day with our clients. They're actually out in San Francisco and actually all over the country, and we all kind of go through what we worked on every day. and. Yeah, just back and forth with developers down there, and it's fun. Um, yeah, so consulting, so a similar setup, usually a small team of two to four people working on a team, um, like a few developers, a few designers, um, working with one client. Um, the only thing I spend a lot of time doing that I haven't heard yet is I spend a lot of time doing code review. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at other people's code, both on my team and on other teams, because it's like a barter system. Like you get people to review your code if you review theirs. Mm -hmm. So you're like always trying to like get points with people. Um, so <laughs> that's, I spend a lot of time doing that, like kind of surfing Slack to see like who needs code review and who can like be my buddy um, to kind of go back and forth on code. And then any higher level discussions are usually like with a client. Um, in Slack or in person. One add-on question to that. Can you explain for the newbies in the house what a code review is and yeah. how it works Yeah, totally. and the benefit of it? Yeah, so a, a code review is, um, it, it's like what it sounds. You're just reviewing somebody's code. Um, and it's mostly, the intent is not to say like, does this work? Because at least the development philosophy that I program with is like test driven. So there should be a test for everything, right? So if the tests are passing, then you're not worried that the code's working. That's taken care of. It's more a matter of, do I understand this code? Because you're always writing code. Like you're not writing the code for the computer. Like you're not trying to be the most efficient. I know some people are like, oh, what's the most efficient data structure? But like, that's not usually the most important thing. The most important thing is, is the next developer who looks at this code gonna understand it because they're gonna have to change it. So I, I use my outside eyes on their code and say, you know, if I got this, I would be pretty confused. Like maybe this should be named differently or this file should be moved. And, just giving them some feedback on like my perspective as an outside developer. Awesome. Um, I'm going to throw a little contentious question in here, specifically more geared towards my designers and developers. Um, should designers learn how to code? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you should. You should learn how to code um, to understand what you're doing. So you can't. You can't build a house, you know, without a basement and foundation. So you can't design a, a website without knowing how it works. Um, we have a lot of, and where I work, we have a lot of struggle when we get graphic designers in that have no uh, background in digital at all because they don't, they don't get the interaction. Um, interactions on a page are much more different than when you're interacting with a mouse or your hands. So you have to understand the base so you can you can talk it and really design for it. Yeah, I mean, I know when I started, I would you know come up with this gorgeous Illustrator thing and I would take it to Kevin over here and then I'm just like, how long will it take me to do this? And he's like, 10 hours. But if we maybe change a couple things here or there, we could probably get it down to two hours. And I'm like, great. And I really, really wanted to learn more of those things. Like, how can we reduce this time? How can we make this simpler? And learning how things are built, you can kind of understand, like, when I design something, I understand what pieces are going to go into it to build it. And I know kind of how long it will take. And maybe sometimes I'll throw in something I don't know how to do, and I'll kind of have to ask around, like, hey, is this insane? Can we think of a better way to do this? And it's just always being open to this feedback of making it better and making it more usable sometimes. Like, sometimes my first pass is not good. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And sometimes I annoy my developers, and I'm like, have you heard about this thing that's like HTML5, and we can do this? <laughs> and it's, you know, it's not, it doesn't work on all browsers, and so they're like, no, we can't do that right now, but eventually we will. So just even just once you've learned, um, keeping up on, on the terminology so that you can uh, speak it a little bit and, and be more friendly. Your, your developer is really your best friend if you're a designer to make what you want um, to come to life. Yeah. That raises a very... That was a nice segue for my next question, which is, how do you guys stay up on trends in, in technologies? And you know, there's a zillion different libraries out there to do a zillion different things. There's, there's GitHub, which is, a, a, for noobs, it's like code repository that it's open source. You can go grab somebody else's code that might be beneficial to you and um, throw it in your project if you want to. So how, how do you guys kind of stay abreast of that stuff? 
Um, I, I know I, I stay up to date um, in a number of different ways. So um, you know, I use Hootsuite to stay up to date with things happening across a lot of different social networks, across Twitter and LinkedIn, things that pe people are sharing. Um, I listen to podcasts uh, on my commute. Um, so I listen to a lot of this, uh, this week in tech and this week in Google and, and trying to stay up on what's happening there as well. Um, and then, you know, other meetups um, within Cincinnati and the digital and, and technical space. Um, when I've had a period of times where I've been not as challenged at work, I've also um, studied on my own, so taken online training courses. Um, there's so many good online training courses. Um, I, I was able to take an art, artificial intelligence class um, that Stanford offered, and it was from you know, the guys that were involved in the Google you know, self-driving cars, so really top-notch. Um, uh, you have really top-notch, or access to really top-notch uh, teachers online. I would say I use some of the same things, um, but also just leveraging a community. Um, in a lot of cases, the, the good news is is that technology evolves, as we've talked about. There's always something new on the horizon, and I, I, I don't do a lot of coding, which my co-founder, who's the CTO, is thankful for. Um, but, but really understanding um, and having a knowledge about why is that tool important? What does it do that's different? What can enable us to do that we couldn't do before? So I, I literally have a, the business eye on the filter of how can we improve the processes that we have around technology? How can we improve our deliverables? Um, but I, in a lot of cases, because I'm not the key knowledgeable person, it's, it's important to build a network and a community where you can say, hey, what do you think about that? Why, and my, my big question is, why do you use that? Why would you change? Um, and so that's the filter I use against some of those types of information sources. Yeah, I definitely think like Hootsuite and podcasts, following up with all those, that's, I definitely do that. Um, the other thing I really like is like learn by doing. So volunteer projects, community projects like Startup Weekend, um, where you are exposed to a lot of other people and it, you know, they have problems that you might not have experienced. So you really get to be creative with what you're doing when you work with other people. Awesome. Um, for the e executive VP level of the house down there, Tell us about how your, your your trajectory kind of how did you how did you get there how did you get to where you are I think a lot of folks in this room would eventually like to make that transition I know so some of the people wrote that in their in their question when they responded to the meetup um, how how do you get how do you move up Can you move up well I, um, I'm in my third chapter of my professional career so I started out um, I would tell you it was great to graduate from college in the mid 80s. I have to tell my age, um, uh -huh. in the mid 80s, but I had a, I had a dual major in um, accounting, and so I'm a CPA and also an information system, so it was a phenomenal time to enter the workforce as a woman. Um, and the good news is with every opportunity I was presented, I took advantage of it. And in many cases, I took the path less traveled, um, which felt right to me, but always expanded, expanded my ability to learn. Mm -hmm. The thing I found really um, interesting about technology um, was I did, there was a time I coded, in many cases it was against the mainframe, that dates me. That dates me. Um, but but the thing about technology that always excited me in any any kind of business setting was that it was a phenomenal problem solver. Um, so I literally leveraged my knowledge about technology um, as well as communication skills and, and networking um, within an organization to figure out how to solve problems. So I was never satisfied with the status quo. Um, always professional in my approach, you know, tried to engage really, really well with folks, but found that opportunities, the doors just started to open. And so it was, as I say, for me, um, I was able to find a couple great mentors, um, and I really ended up my career um, from a corporate perspective um, as chief information officer because I knew how to solve problems. I had belief in organizational development and the power of technology within our organization. Um, built a great team who did really, really awesome things that frankly made me look good for, for, for really engaging them and developing them. Um, so that, that as, I, as I led it. But technology for me in my second chapter, um, I did general management consulting for the last 10 years with small to medium sized clients. Um, contracts I did on my own. And it was great because I went in as a member of their team with that same problem solving perspective. And I long term contracts. Um, and literally in this third chapter, found a problem in my personal life I was really trying to solve and knew the technology was a great lever to do that. And so I'm just gathering, again, you know, teams and peoples and communities of interest to use technology to solve a problem. That's great. 
Um, I think in a similar fashion, I, I was always a problem solver. Um, you know, I, I graduated in math and computer science, so I went straight into uh, consulting. Um, was actually interviewed by Kelly Dolan in the in the audience, who's a great um, leader, very young leader at that company. It was Software Architects uh, Consulting, uh, which eventually was was purchased by uh, Sagetti. Um, but from there, you know, I, I transitioned into a full-time role at Fidelity Investments, um, and so I was still on a development team. Uh, transitioned to a lead development role, started interacting more and more with, um, you know, our project teams, my manager. I wanted to have a bigger influence over, you know, our projects, the work, and so, you know, an opportunity came up for a management position and I applied. My husband, who's also a developer, you know, gave me a very hard time for um, uh, kind of deciding to leave that all development role at the time. But I, I personally loved the opportunity. I loved the opportunity to manage others and help develop others and, and also to increase my influence there. Um, you know, and I eventually found my way in, into the agency world, um, which was a completely different world, but much more fast pace than Fidelity was. And so I've, I've found um, in my previous role and then in this role, it's really been a new opportunity to combine technology and working more with clients in order to grow you know, our business with current clients and then also to seek new opportunities for, for Rockfish. So it's always been problem solving, working with others, but then I've also been very lucky to have good mentors um, at the various companies um, that I've worked. Um, at Fidelity, um, there were a lot of men in management, but um, you know, there was a period of time where there was a female CIO that came in, and she really stirred up a lot of things. Um, really made a lot of people uncomfortable, but then she also opened up, opened a lot of doors for me. So I was able to get um, some phenomenal uh, leadership and management training that I probably wouldn't have had the opportunity um, to do had she not pulled me into um, some of those opportunities. So I've been fortunate, um, and so I'm always trying to look out and see how I can help others that are also interested in, in uh, this field. Yeah, I think just to just to grow on that, ask. So, like, if you if you want something, um, they're not gonna know. Like, they they have no idea what I want to do or what I what I want to be. So, you have to tell your managers where you want to go and where you see yourself. Um, taking that proactive step will really help you grow your career exponentially. And then seek out your own mentors. Like, a mentor is usually not just gonna fall into your lap. You kind of have to hound them, and then like, oh, okay, you're really interested in this, and then. <laughs> And then they'll take notice of you. So I, I really suggest both of those things because I'm I'm an introvert um, at heart. You know, when I'm at work, I have my headphones on and my my hoodie up, and I'm doing my thing. Um, and then people were just passing me by. So you know, I had to raise my hand and be like, Hey, why aren't you looking at me for that next thing? Um, and I I highly suggest that that's the only way um, you'll you'll move. In, in my mind, is to move forward. You have to tell people yeah. what you want and then and go after it. Um, and then if you're not getting it where you are, you can start talking to other people at these events and. Maybe I'll get to that next step. Um, that segues really nicely into what I was about to ask, which Shannon was saying is, is do you have, ha, have you had any mentors in your life? And, and, and who was that person? And how did you identify that person? And what was that relationship like? Um, any, anybody else? I can go. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how many people know Wendy from Centrifuge here. Um, but she's now the CEO. The lady that just came in with the adorable dog. <laughs> um, so I used to work for her when I was doing marketing. Um, and it was interesting because I told various other people at the company. I mean, she was the CEO, right? So like there were many layers between us. Um, but I told some people at the company I was interested in coding and like word got out to her and she like called me into her office and was like, I know you want to be a developer. <laughs> she's like, well, how are we going to make that happen? And um, so while she's not a developer, she doesn't have a technical background. Um, she's just an amazing CEO. But I think that having someone like that on your team and excited for, for you is huge. 
Um, because, I mean, first of all, you don't feel like you have to like pretend that you want something that you don't. You know, I didn't, wasn't pretending that I wanted to be promoted at marketing. I could be honest with everyone about what I was looking to do next. Um, and then when I finally was ready to kind of take the leap and, and leave and get my first job as a developer, like she was rooting for me and like threw me a going away party. Mm-hmm. And that was great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to pause here because uh, see if there's questions in the audience. Go ahead, Hillary. Got it. So I think I'll restate the question in case anyone couldn't hear. Um, the question is about different careers, I guess within development, um, yeah. in terms of like if as you're going down a path and you're going to leverage your strengths, like if you're good at working with people or maybe you're strong and you already have a marketing job, for example, a marketing career, um, how can you leverage those in your career and like where does that, where do those two things what, what go? Was the like hardcore, a hardcore attack. Sit at your computer yeah. or use more of your people skills. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't divide it as sit at your computer or use people skills because obviously I'm also sitting at a computer all day. Um, <laughs> um, but I guess, I mean, I guess the point I was trying to make there is that I think people, like most of the people that I know who are software developers, and I know a ton of them now, like are not inventing the wheel, right? Like, they're not, like, inventing a programming language. They're not, you know, developing the Google search algorithm that, like, fixes all your typos and all that stuff. Like, they're just, they're just doing basic web development, building web apps, you know, trying to solve problems with technology. But a lot of times, they're not necessarily technology problems. Technology is just the solution. Um, so that, in that case, the tech that you're using is not anything new. You're taking advantage of anything. So I guess what I would say is like there's no dividing. It's not like at some point I was like, I'm going to be in consulting and I did this different path. Um, I just discovered when I was like on the interview circuit trying to find a job that like there were a lot of jobs that were excited about my background in marketing. They were excited that I could work with teams, that were excited that I wanted to work with other people. And, um, and as for like who, you know, I don't know. I'm sure people at SpaceX are doing some pretty hardcore some hardcore tech. <laughs> I don't know them personally, so. I think I think at large companies, um, and it depends on the company, but if you have a more enterprise company um, like Fifth Third Bank and their bank processing systems and their ATMs and, and all the things that they need to run their business, you will have very, very large um, development teams and they are focused on making you know those transactions as fast as possible um, and as accurate as possible um, and, and as secure as possible um, and so those in those problems you'll find that those teams are super specialized in back-end or mainframe or um, web um, and they will be you know behind working behind their desk but they're still working interacting with people um, at the same time, you'll have the other extreme where you've got a designer that's also your front-end developer, or you'll have one developer at a small agency like Northlick mm-hmm. where um, uh, that developer is responsible for anything that comes up. <laughs> so they will be responsible for email development, back-end development, front-end development, all across the board, and they have to 
go back and forth between you know a mobile website and you know a more traditional website or you know a lot of different uh, mediums. So I would say it, you see a varying level of of development types depending on the type of industry and the type of company mm -hmm. and how large that company is. Mm -hmm. um, and then even then outside of development, you know, I think this panel represents a lot of the different, um, you know, uh, different, different roles that interact with technology um, and, and, you know, you still have to be aware of technology and trends in technology and in order to be um, excellent at, at your role. Any other questions from the house before I take a go ahead? Yeah, my question is I I used to belong because I have been around the block for many years. I used to belong to many women societies. Mm -hmm. But I have not seen any society to help women more legally if they have legal issues. They are harassed in very long time. And they're harassed in a way that can very easily improve. None of the societies that I know step in. None of the societies at least listen about what's going on, about the fears that we may have. And uh, a good number of women are living in the area of the young ladies because they cannot take it anymore. I am doing the streets in my career because I cannot take it anymore. Bullying and harassment at the cost of level. And then they want me to have a nice face and the young girls, okay, start engineering. So let me let me re repeat the questions because she's gonna, she's hitting on my kind of my next big subject is um, th th the question was basically about advocacy and and kind of protection for lack of a better word for for women in this community. So um, you know we we know this is a male dominated. Um, world and we know that especially in tech like it's it's kind of hard like the bro culture is real those of you who've heard me talk before know that i talk a lot about bro culture being a very real thing in tech and so um have you guys had any experiences um with uh any organizations that have that have kind of helped you come along that path or, or any societies or even even just kind of internally within your own company um do you have a framework of of help uh, in, in getting you there, um, kind of outside of, of like your, your management or your uh, mentors? It's a tough question. Thank you for that. Yeah. So um, as far as societies, uh, the YWCA um, is all about eliminating racism and empowering women. Um, I just participated in a leadership program with them, and it's fantastic because I just realized there are so many women that are my age um, that are sort of experiencing the same things. Um, you know, men are getting promoted before them, um, you know, struggles with the boy culture. When I graduated from DEP, I was in digital design, so that's like the techie version of design. Um, I was one of, of three women that actually graduated um, out of a class of 40. So it definitely a boys club, it was like a men's mm -hmm. locker room. So I, I understand where, where, where that comes from, but um, it also, it, coming from that situation has helped me um, bring up other women um, with me, so you kind of, um, we say lift as we climb, so as you're moving forward, you're also bringing the next woman behind you and you're sort of helping them through those experiences. Um, it's, really a, it's really a network. You have to find your, your, um, your own path. And if there is, um, for me, this, this is a great example. So I, when, I, when I got hired, I, was, I worked at Bridge Worldwide. When I was interviewed, um, I interviewed with these two great women, uh, Mara Chicken and Carrie Broderick. Mm -hmm. and I was like, oh my God, I want to work with these women. I see myself, my future, right? They're these amazing creative directors. That's where I want to go. Um, and then the next group, I interviewed with these guys and I was like, oh, I really don't want to work with them. You know, they're <laughs> asking me like the wrong questions, right? Yeah. Um, but I ended up going there. I ended up being at um, Bridge and it was an amazing experience for, for four years. Um, because of those women, I worked on their team. And then when I when I actually transitioned, it was really hard because I was in love with my art director. I got another female that had helped me grow. Um, and then I, when I went to North Lake, one of the reasons I went is because the CEO there is, is a female. So um, not saying that you always have to work underneath women to be successful, right. but for me, that's it's motivating to see women in higher positions. Um, and you know that if they're there, they're gonna bring you up with them. Um, I, a, a good example, though, at Northrop, we're really small. 
um, we, when I went on this TV shoot, this producer was just like kind of sleazy, um, director guy, and he was hitting on our script supervisor. That's the person that sort of takes notes to make sure everybody is saying the right lines at the right time. And you're like, I love that take and she'll mark it for you. So when you're in the ad suit later, you know, it's a really important role. Um, wouldn't he wouldn't talk to me. You know, this is my shoot, this is my concept coming to life. He would not look at me or talk to me. He would only speak to my career director. So I finally, you know, I pulled my career director aside and he's like, I see what's going on. So he gave him the silent treatment. He would not, he was very supportive. He would not talk to the director. He said, you have to talk to Lara first and then we'll make decisions. So it was really great to have that support. So I, I think you have to look for as much as, if something is happening at work, I really, I highly suggest you reach out to someone that is, if it's your direct manager, that's not your manager, this may be an aside person, mm -hmm. um, maybe even on the same level that you can both potentially approach um, if you're afraid of being singled out. If you can um, find an advocate for yourself, whether it be a partner, maybe it's a, somebody on another team, um, to let them know what's going on. I think it's really important to have one-on-ones with people that aren't just your direct managers to sort of let them know how you're feeling and adjusting. So if you do have a problem with... Um, okay, you can address my situation. Yeah, sure. I work for a university. Okay. And it's well known what's coming. Okay. Because they think in a very long time. But in the university, they can't establish this thing. And sure. And the rule is not hiding behind it. Then nobody can go ahead and do that. Right. So the best... The best thing that the women associations can do is to offer the legal advice and legal support and at least to have to give a way for women to express their fears. Okay. To abstain there sometimes, but what if these guys make up a false story which they can do obviously because they can do. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. is what I mean. Sure. For uh, academia works. That's why it's, it's different, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, they right. were different to them, they just were. People have brains. But then you have bullies, then you see them, you guys are not. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I de I've definitely, when I was in college, I suffered from that, and it was. The result was, you know, well, there was tenure. So, I mean, I, I know what you are talking about as far as that. I think with the tech and startup industry, I, I really want to say I've had a great experience. I mean, I've had people who have been really supportive. I've had those same situations come up where, um, you know, I was a co an equal co-founder of a company um, with three gentlemen, and it was always like everyone always went straight to them. Like I was not even there, you know. So, but they were all very supportive of me to be like, no, this is our creative person, this is our UX person, like go to her, ask her what's going on. Um, so I think just like finding that champion. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, just again, like, because you had mentioned I'm on the startup weekend, um, I've co-found that as well. You know, we've heard those kinds of fears too, that women are a little more hesitant to come to those events because one, they're not sure what's going to happen. You know, they know that there's going to be a lot of men there. They know that it's a, like a high pressure situation, um, which is exactly why we made the specific women's event to really open that up and let um, people who experience it who may not have been comfortable doing that before. So, I mean, I think like having these events that are, you know, kind of a doorway into it are really helpful too. Mm -hmm. I actually had the opposite experience. So I had, I, I found that in education that I felt like it was more of a meritocracy. It was more like I was, I was being judged by my test scores and how I was doing in class. And it was, it was so, so much less political. And then when I started consulting, I had no idea, you know, I was so naive at the time. Um, but I was getting judged by how I looked um, you know, she certainly can't program based on how she looks. She's not very technical. Um, and then, you know, and I would see in meetings, uh, you know, when things got technical, eye contact, you know, would lose, uh, you know, I wouldn't get looked at in those meetings. Um, but you, you know, to Laura's point earlier, I think you have to be bold. Um, as, a, as a woman in technology, you have to go over the, you have to go out of your way and, and um, really make a point, um, you know, to go after the opportunities that are there and also seek advocates for you um, within the current organization. That could be other women. Um, and in some cases it's been um, women for me, in some cases it's been men that um, see the potential uh, in, in women being in technical roles.
I would say I started my um, so my first 24 years working in financial services, which is very male dominated. Um, and, and I'll use this term a little bit out of context, but um, I literally stalked, not in a bad way, but but, um, but but I stalked opportunity in the sense that's what I want. Um, I had a lot of grit and persistence around achieving it. Um, I was very um, very aware of, of who the influence makers were, whether I was in a small group or a large organization, um, and, and making sure that I form relationships with them. I think someone mentioned it earlier. These are the things that I'm trying to accomplish. Um, and anytime I had an opportunity, uh, and I, I came to work in the mid 80s, which was sort of like work 100,000 hours a week. Um, but I never let any opportunity literally go unworked, and I would I would make everyone understand that when you give me that opportunity, it was gonna it was gonna turn out better than you expected. Um, and then over time, just developed. It's gonna sound kind of crazy, but I developed an air of confidence um, that when I walked into a room with the people I worked with, there was an element of respect. Um, and there are some things you reach that point. Um, and then I made a, a portion of my career out of being literally the most ignorant person at the table, but literally having the confidence to ask questions no one else would ask. Mm -hmm. um, so it's this, it's this you, you create almost, this, you have to create the situation for yourself and you will attract the right resources, but you have to be persistent and deliberate about it. Um, and not all situations, and, and the nice thing, um, I'll say 30 years later, the nice thing about today, being a woman in business, and I have a 20 year old and I'm thrilled for her, um, is that with that same level of greater persistence, the opportunity opportunities are tenfold, but mm -hmm. they used to be. And many organizations, the right organizations, are literally looking for you. They literally are looking for you. Um, but you have to be persistent, and it has to yeah. be about you taking responsibility for it. Yeah, and you definitely like speak up, be loud, be you know whatever it takes, because that you would get drowned out. You know, like you were mm -hmm. saying before. I mean, it just um, you have to speak out. I think. It's been a blessing and a curse being married to a, a male developer too. Like, uh, so I, I remember very young in my career when we first started dating, like I would bring up situations that would come up in my day to day and compare to his day to day. And he was just, he would, he would be like, no, there's no way. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah. and, and so I think, I think as a, as a male developer, there's, you don't understand or recognize um, what the the female developer on your team may be experiencing, you know, yes. being the, yeah. the the odd girl out <laughs> in a large team of males, and you know, even if it's just from a social standpoint, going to lunch, um, you know, it's so many times you you, you know you feel yourself you, you feel yourself uh, left out um, and in a different different situation. So, question for Jesse is. A couple of people asked this in their in their responses on their RSVP. Is uh, what's the what's the what's the world like in, in San Francisco? I mean, San Francisco relative to Cincinnati, uh, obviously, is, is a far more progressive city. Um, just for comparison, as far as what we understand from Girl Development, like our chapter in San Francisco is ginormous. It is the largest. I think it is the single largest chapter that we have. Um, they have something to the tune of four, four or five thousand members. They're teaching very, very, very advanced level um, um, classes, things like that. Obviously, a, a, a bigger city and a more progressive city. Um, do you feel like? Uh, it is more welcoming to women in technology. Is it, is it more open or, or is the, like all the stories coming out of Silicon Valley, are, are those kind of prevalent in your life? Like, do, do you have those similar experiences? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly there are, so like she was saying, our Girl Development chapter is like 5,000 people, like meet, you know, hundreds and thousands of people at meet up, thousands of people at meetups. I still, like, if I see a female at a developer conference and I don't know her, it's still weird. Like, I'm still like, who is that woman? I don't know. <laughs> like, it's, it's, so it still feels like it's a small community because they're, you know, it's a funnel for the marketers in the room. It's a funnel. So, like, there are a lot of people. <laughs> there are a lot of people at the top and a lot of people have general interest and then, you know, people filter out. So by the time you get to the level of professional developer and especially senior developer, um, like, it's pretty rare for me to work with another woman who's a senior developer. There are, are more junior developers for women, um, but that's actually kind of a problem. It's not a problem we can easily solve. We can't, like, put ourselves in a time capsule and fast forward, but um, it's one of the challenges is, like someone was referring to earlier, like, when I meet somebody, they, like, assume, like, I've been to meetups as, like, a volunteer, 
and people are like, oh, like the, you know, the newbie badge is over there. Just go put it on, and like we'll tell you how to turn on your computer. And I'm like, okay, no, like I, I know what I'm doing here. And um, there's an assumption that you're new, and a lot of times that assumption is right just because of the numbers, right? Like there are a lot of women who are kind of interested, and fewer women who are more senior. So. Um, I guess that's the biggest challenge. I mean, luckily, that's the largest challenge that I've had to deal with is just that is the assumption that because you're a female, you're brand new to this, as opposed to the assumption that you're like super competent and senior and experienced. Any questions? For, yes, Ms. Janine. Um, sorry, I'm short. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've, I've had my S degree been looking to go back into uh, development and so I have the academic background I have a lot of confidence because I've had careers I've been in healthcare mostly mm -hmm. and when I, I've had no problems getting interviews but this is what I find is that when I go in is oh you're really confident and you can manage things we're going to make you a manager mm -hmm. and I'm wondering how you carve out especially you Jesse with what you said kind of most really how do you carve out the time, like in your day, it's not your full-time job, to get the uh, development school skills and the techie skills? You know, like you said, you don't have that instant credibility that men seem to have mm -hmm. in the business. So how, how do you develop that um, as, as a side or do you just look for that internship? Like what would be your recommendations for, mm -hmm. for that type of person? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. I would just, the, and what I did was, you know, I had certain, I actually went to school for genetics. I was like a science person, and then I was a graphic designer, and then I landed on UX, and I was in this position where I wanted, I knew the job that I wanted, but I didn't have the background to get there. Um, so I just, you know, very, I <laughs> edited my resume to what I wanted them to see for that job, and then I supplemented with volunteer work and um, startup weekend again. I know I keep mentioning it, but like that, I went to one in January 2012, and that was when I really started getting a lot of experience and had, you know, was able to add a bunch of projects to my portfolio. And then, um, yeah, again, volunteer work, like just finding small businesses who need things or um, community projects. And you know, it, it's as some people look at it as like free work, but I typically find people who really need my skills and I'm benefiting them, you know, so that makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. It's beneficial to them, it helps my resume, and then, you know, eventually you just get enough things that you go and, you know, there's no management on there and they don't look at that and you're like, here's what I want to do and here's why I can do it. You know, it's really listed out there, so. I think it depends on what you want to be doing too. So, yeah. I mean, if you, want to, to manage but you also want to develop there I mean there are positions Definitely. out there where you can you, where you can still be developing in the code or, or, or also doing code reviews managing a technical team you still have to stay up to date um, with some of the latest because you're, you're you're leading a team of developers but it really depends on what you want to be doing so if you want to truly be developing then then I would encourage you to get involved either um, online training or um, in local community events or DDI. I'll say for me, so my original talk that I was going to give today was just going to be like a description of my path in detail. And I did, I did like a test run a few times with a friend and they were like, this talk is so boring. And <laughs> <laughs> because, because my path, in terms of like the actual steps of like what happened on day one, like from 2010, I think it was like September 2010 when I first went to a, a programming workshop to when I got my first job was almost three years. And in that time, it wasn't like, oh, I studied every night and like I loved Ruby. It's like I bought a Rails book that was two years old and it made no sense. I went to a workshop that sucked. I applied to an internship and I like didn't know what an array was and they made fun of me. Um, so I had a lot of stops and starts. I'll say really like so that's just maybe that just has to be part of everybody's path um, it, it helped me it helped me grow my my persistent strength um, but things that were super super important to get to where I am today number one is I did end up going to a boot camp right so um, that really took me from f being the kind of person who could follow a tutorial 
um, but not much more to being someone who could like receive a feature spec and execute it still poorly, right? Like you don't graduate an expert in these things, but like at least able to kind of write code specific to a situation. So that was really, really crucial. Like I would not be where I am today if I hadn't have t attended a boot camp. And you know, there are boot camps that are online that are part time, so you don't have to do it like the full time thing. Um, but that was really critical for me. And then the other was um, that I went through an apprenticeship at ThoughtBot. So apprenticeships are similar to internships. Um, it's like a three month process where you basically shadow somebody and like do their job with them. Um, and that was really, really critical because you know, your first job in any field is, is terrifying. Um, you're like, someone's gonna pay me to do this. <laughs> and, and in consulting, even more so, because you're like, they're gonna pay me how much to do this? Like, every hour? And so those three months, um, like, if you can find a company with an internship or apprenticeship program, like, that's awesome. Because then they realize how great you are as a person. And so, and they go, you know, like, oh, you wanna be a developer? Great, do that. Like, whatever you, like, they'll help you get to where you wanna go once they appreciate, like, how awesome you are to work with. Um, but yeah, like, those two, if I didn't have those two things, I would still be, you know, going to workshops and trying to figure it out, so <laughs> super important. Um, let me grab, I, we're, we're about out of time, everybody, um, and I, and I want to give you guys a couple minutes at the end. Uh, one, I want to respect that most of us have to go to work now, and two, um, I want to give you guys a couple minutes at the end to come up and mingle with the um, panelists if you want. Um, so let me grab one more question over here, and then um, we'll kind of wrap up and, and mingle. Cincinnati folks got yeah, any Cincinnati you folks. got any insights on on yeah. kind of where you started or where you might have gotten some internships or apprenticeships or experience I mean it, it's really tough I know we tried to do this at Gaslight we've taken on some co-ops before and having been through the co-op program at UC myself how important that internship was and that experience it it takes time it's it's really amazing how much time it takes out of your day to be a mentor to someone or to take the time to teach someone who's new at things and I knew that's something we struggle here at Gaslight. We are a small company. We are fully engaged with our clients and like taking that time out to help someone along learning these concepts is very difficult. And I know it's something we're trying to get better at and how can we do better at that and helping people in the community. And I'm curious to hear the answers if anyone has any ideas. Well, I think so. I think most of the agency, if I'm from the agency world, we have um, internships and they kind of go with the school quarter, but that doesn't mean if you're not in school, you can't apply for them. Mm. Um, we just had somebody drop off an illustrated lamp the other day. So they actually came down to the agency and brought this thing that was really cool and, and was able to spend time with us. So sometimes it's, it's even just swinging by. Um, I know not everybody appreciates that, but we're a smaller place. So um, like I said, we, ha we have rotating, we have probably four interns, plus or minus, depending on each department um, each year. And, so, and a lot of the agencies in town do that, so it's just, mm. Even if you're not in school, you can still apply for those things. I think a lot of startups in the community too are really interested in taking on people. Mm -hmm. um, I know when we were, I was at Listener and we took on quite a few college students um, just because we wanted to do that for the community and we wanted to, you know, have them experience what was happening. Um, so I mean, you know, and, and with startups too, the great part is that, you know, <laughs> I hate to say this, but not all of them really value like a solid education. So even if you're someone who may not be like, you know, in school or you got a master's degree or, you know, like if you're just really passionate about it and you're the right person, they will like, you know, give you a chance. Like if you're loud enough and if you put yourself out there enough, they absolutely will give you a chance. Or, or some of the accelerators like Brandery yeah. or. Yeah, um, I was gonna give a shout out. Actually, there's a couple centrifuge folks here. <laughs> right here Christ down front. <laughs> and, uh, and Christina Swift, who works with, um, with Centrifuge is um, working on and around sourcing and, and tech. And so 
Um, I can't say that there's steady work with a lot of startups, um, but there's definitely demand and need. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's a part-time gig, but you can start to build your resume definitely. in terms yeah. of here's the experiences that I've had, here's the types of teams I've worked with, here's the type of industries, depending on what the, what the app or the, the tech business may be. Um, it's a good way to get some experience quickly, although I don't think it translates quickly into steady employment. Um, but over time, I think you build a resume that makes steady employment obviously a lot more, more fun. Yeah. Thanks, Lady. Um, and one other add to that. So one, of course, I'm going to plug our girl development classes. So we have another, we have another kind of wave of classes. We kind of operate quarterly, so we start with like the very beginner's first steps um, at the beginning of every quarter. So that will start. Um, we're taking June off, and then we will start up again in July. So we will have a large slew of classes forthcoming there. Um, girl development also has partnerships with a lot of different organizations. Like Block.io is currently offering scholarships specifically to women in the um, in the Midwest region. So um, if, if you're a Girl Development member and uh, you're in Cincinnati, they're giving away a scholarship a month for I, what I believe is a nine-week or an 18-week online program. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, reach out to us. We also have a jobs board on our Meetup page um, at, at meetup.com. There's a discussion section, and it, within that, there is a jobs forum um, that we've got recruiters that post to all the time. And um, like... Um, who said that? Julie, Julie said that. <laughs> I was like, somebody You're down the there. Ass. Somebody down there <laughs> said it. Um, like Julie said, um, Centrifuge is always looking for folks to connect with the startups that they work with. Um, Cincy Tech also does that as well. Um, and so I, I encourage you, feel free to, to use us. Um, use GDI as a resource because we have, we have a lot of connections in the community um, it, that are, you know, people come to us and say like, hey, I need to hire somebody. Mm -hmm. And we say, um, go check out our jobs board and go post it here. You know what, you know what I mean? So feel free to uh, tap our network at any time. We are here for you. Um, we are not just here to teach you how to code, but we are here to foster that community um, and, and to help you guys um, connect and, and, and get together and meet up with each other. And so, um, one other thing I'll note is that we are also going to have an anniversary party, a third year anniversary party coming up in, um, we haven't locked the date yet, but it'll be in the early, in early July, I'm thinking the second week of July. Um, and we, we really want that to be this big awesome thing for people to come to and, and not only um, just celebrate with us, our community, but also network with some, some folks. And so we, we would encourage you to come to that. So just keep an eye out on our meetup page because um, that's where we post all of those things. So I think I've run a couple minutes over. Thank you all for your time. Panelists, Jesse, thank you guys so much for coming in and volunteering your time.